After telling the pastor last week that he could no longer advertise with the word Jesus, Colorado Springs officials now reviewing that decision. I asked them why we could no longer use the name of Jesus, and they said it's because uh, if you use the name of Jesus, we must allow hate messaging. What kind of world is this if we can't say that Jesus is Lord? Pastor Lawson Purdue and Karis Christian Center have been advertising their Jesus campaign for three years, but they were told last week if they want to continue advertising, they can no longer use the name Jesus. It will be illegal for Christians to share their faith outside of a church building. We are no longer a Christian nation. This country that you're living in right now has rejected God. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected the revelation of Scripture. Therefore, they have received the spirit of Antichrist. This world is worshiping the devil through so-called science and their religion and everything else that makes up their lives. Like we said in Sunday school this morning, if the devil can cause the word of God to be, if you can doubt it, cause you to doubt the scripture, then he's going to assault your faith. Therefore, we believe the Bible. We believe it because the Holy Spirit witnesses to the fact that what is in you witnesses with the book you hold in your hands, the word of the living God. And the consummation, the final achievement, the capstone, the crowning jewel to all the Bible is the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And rightly so that the, that the subject of the last book of the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the last book of the Bible is written so that it might reveal the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ would have us know in the end time, the end of the ages as we live in right now. Let me say this to you at this very minute. I am firmly convinced that I see an acceleration of things happening around me, that there is no way in the world that it's going to continue without the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either the Son of the living God is going to come and rapture His bride up, or God's going to open the heavens and pour judgment down upon this world. There is no way that we can continue with what's happening in America and the rest of this world. There's no way that God will tolerate this and put up with it without either a direct intervention in judgment or catching his bride up to meet him. I hope it's the latter. I hope he says, come up hither and we meet him in the clouds and in the air. So as the book of Revelation is written to reveal, let's look at some of the things that it does reveal. In Revelation chapter number 1, verses 12 through 17, the Bible said, I've turned to see the voice that spoke with me. I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, just notice especially verse number 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire. This identifies him completely with the Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel. The Ancient of Days means that this is the Eternal One. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the Eternal One. The Lord Jesus Christ did not have a beginning. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the Son of God without a beginning. He never started anywhere. He has always been from everlasting to everlasting. So the book of Revelation starts out identifying Christ and placing him in eternity in his rightful place. There is none higher and there is none beside our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty that will do the judging throughout this book. In the book of Revelation chapter number 4, we have a revelation of heaven. And this is some of what the Apostle Paul saw when he was caught up there that was unlawful. First of all, we find in verse number 3 of Revelation 4, he was set there to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. We find the rainbow show up first when God gave it as a sign to Noah that he would never destroy the earth again with water. Now here we have that rainbow in heaven, my friend, not part of a bow, but a complete bow. And it is God showing that he is always true and faithful with the covenants and promises that he makes. Here, my friend, we find God saying again that judgment must come from him and him alone. In verse number 6, we read in Revelation 4, Before the throne there was a sea of glass. Can you imagine a sea of glass? And verse number 8, it says, We have four beasts that cease not, night and day, crying, Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. How big is that sea? How wide is that sea? 
How great is that seed? But we know this for sure. We know there is a throne on that seed, and we know that one sits upon that throne who is the judge of all the universe. We're starting out the book of Revelation by identifying God in Christ manifest in the flesh and identifying the fact that He is capable and He is able and He has a rightful place to judge everything that exists. And then it says that He is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Even though we have a judgment poured out upon this earth, even though the book of Revelation talks about angels and demons, even though the book of Revelation deals with those that are condemned to hellfire, the beast, the dragon, and all of that, he is separate, separate, separate unto himself. In plain words, what he says, he says from a throne of power and might and glory. So we find in Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 8, a revelation of the earth's conditions. In Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. My friend, think about what you just read. We find a time coming when the world will be worshiping the devil incarnate as the Antichrist. It'll be Satan in flesh. This country that you're living in right now has rejected God. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected the revelation of Scripture. Therefore, they have received the spirit of Antichrist. This world is worshiping the devil through so-called science and their religion and everything else that makes up their lives. If you had been in Sunday school this morning, you would have heard me deal with the issues of how that, that evolution is a religion that in that religion is leading up to God men on this earth who worship themselves and they worship the devil. The religion of this world today is the religion of self-worship and self-love in worshiping the devil, amen. So that's the condition of the earth. In Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 9, we have the revelation of the saints. In Revelation 5, 9, we read this, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. The cross made him worthy. His sinless life made him worthy. The shed blood made him worthy. The fact that he never said a thing for, any, for himself, but it was for someone else, made him worthy. The fact that God sent him from heaven down to this world to save my soul, made him worthy. If there ever was a worthy one, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, not me. He is worthy. One of the things that runs through the book of Revelation is that the Son of God is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of your worship. He is worthy of your adoration. He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your life. Give it to Him and dedicate your soul to His high and holy name. Worthy is the Lamb. Is He worthy? Yes, He's worthy in every sense of the word. So in Revelation chapter 5, it says, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. In plain words, you are worthy to pour judgment about, out upon mankind. I'm not. I would not want that burden upon me to have mankind march before me and to judge mankind for his sins and for eternity. No, thank you. No way would I want anything to do with that. But there is one who has the right to sit down on the throne and say whether you go to heaven or to hell. He has a right to judge your soul. He is worthy. He paid for that right on the cross at Calvary when he said, Father, it is finished. He bought and paid for the right to judge us. Look at verse number 9. Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals, for thou wast slain, and hast I loved this word, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred tongue, people, and nation. It takes the blood that was shed at the cross at Calvary to save your soul. Salvation is to look to the cross at Calvary and there to accept the sin offering for your sins, to fall down before him completely condemned, without hope and without God, and plead for the blood to cleanse your sins away. And by doing that, salvation comes into your heart, into your soul. You cannot be saved any other way. And so they were redeemed. I want you to notice in Revelation chapter 14 verse 11, this is the revelation of the condemned. I hate that word, don't you? 
That's a terrible word, but it's a biblical word. Revelation 14 and verse number 11. Look carefully at the scripture. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. We are at that place. We are not coming to that place. We are at the door of the mark of the beast. The my friend, that mark is here right now. I say I cannot identify it for you, but I want you to know it is a reality. And that mark will be taken by tens of millions of people. And by doing that, they seal their doom in hell. In Revelation 14, 11, it said, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. If you ever lived in an age where you need to be diligent, it is this one. If you ever lived in a time when man should be watching out of the corner of his eye, it is now. There is deception like a blanket that is coming down upon humanity. And you're living in those days. You are living in the end of time. You are living in the final hour. I don't know when Christ is coming. My little short lifetime is just a span of vapor. I'm here today and gone tomorrow. But I'll tell you this. He could come in my lifetime. He could come when I'm here. Hallelujah to God if he did. No greater thing could happen to me than to hear him shout my name. My name of all the names. When he says, come up hither, he will direct that toward me. And he'll shout my name. Like he said, Mary, in the garden that early Sunday morning, he'll call my name. And make no mistake about it, he won't get me confused with you. He knows who I am. My sheep know my voice. And a stranger they will not hear. And when I hear my name, I'm leaving here, friends. I hope you're ready. I am, thank God, one of the redeemed. Now, ninth chapter of the book of Revelation is unbelievable. The ninth chapter of the book of Revelation is one of those things when you read it, if you didn't believe the Bible, you'd say, what a crazy thing this is. The bottomless pit opens, and these locusts come up out of the pit, and they got stingers, and they don't look like anything that you've ever seen before. The description and definition of them is nothing earthly. It is completely paranormal, yet it is the Word of God. I believe it. So Bible says in Revelation chapter number 9 and verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Apollyon and Abaddon are the names of this angel that comes up out of this pit. Here is a creature, make no mistake about it. I don't care how large, I don't care how powerful, I don't care how great, I don't care how beautiful, I don't care how big, it doesn't matter to me what it is. It is still lower than the Lord God Almighty. And here in Revelation chapter number 9, this angel of the bottomless pit comes up. He's getting ready to come up, folks. The pit's about to open. Demons are all running, running wild on this earth. Men are running naked through the streets. All you got to do is go to, look, go to Google and type it in. And in Europe especially, they got naked men running through the streets. Stark, raving, demon possessed. It's coming to America. Just the other day, one of the big mega churches in, our, in, in Australia gathered at New York City and they had this big flodoo and they had a cowboy get up on the stage and this cowboy got up there with his, with his guitar and now my dear friend, would you listen to me? You can Google what I'm saying. He was naked and this was a church service. Are you following me? The day will come when sex is part of the worship service because the world is headed in that direction and this church has already embraced the spirit of antichrist i beg you today reject that spirit and turn to the holy ghost and the holy one for your soul is at stake you've got to make a choice in the book of Revelation, chapter number 16, verse 1, is the revelation of the judgments from above. In Revelation, chapter number 16, and verse 1, we read these words. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, watch this, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. 
My friend, these come in three different layers. They come by trumpets, they come by seals, and then they come by vials. In each case, the judgment is worse. Heaven has been opened, and God is pouring His wrath down upon the earth. It's not my place this morning to judge God. It's not my place today to second guess God. It's not my place today to try to figure out all the reasons that God may judge. But there's one thing that I will say to you today. He's still my God. It makes no difference, my friend. It doesn't change a thing. The Lord is the Lord. He saved my unworthy soul. He called me out of hell. And He wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'll stand with Abraham. And I'll say to him, Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Right? He will do right. Hallelujah to God. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12, we have the revelation of Satan and the Antichrist. Yes, sir. The book of Revelation is about revealing things, my dear friend. Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And then what follows is a battle, a war, between the only archangel mentioned in the Bible and the devil. They walk, my friend. They go to pot, they go to bat, they go to combat, they go to war. They butt heads. Michael and his angels take on Satan and his angels. And it's not a light thing. No, the Bible calls it a war in heaven. We're talking about a spiritual upheaval like this place has never known before. The Bible tells us plain with the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's all of us, all over this world. Right now the world is being ruled by a satanic elite. And do you think God's going to let that continue? No. He's going to call out the one that's going to stand eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe with the devil. Now what makes me think this in chapter number 12 is directly related related to Israel is what it says in Daniel chapter number 12. For in the book of Daniel chapter number 12, God said, Daniel, Michael standeth for thy people. And Michael is an archangel. He is an angel above angels. So in Revelation 12, he is standing for the children of Israel. Have you noticed how the federal government in this country has turned against Israel? Not only have we brought down upon us perversion and reproach, not only has this country turned from the living God, not only is this country right now, while you're here this morning, persecuting Christians, but now, my friend, it has turned against Israel. And I want you to understand something. America just happens to be one of the many nations. And it can be here today and gone tomorrow. The only kingdom that will ever stand, and it will stand forever, is when it says in Revelation chapter 11, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and this Christ. Notice it's a kingdom with a king sitting on a throne of some monarchy. He has a crown on his head. He's a king over the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And both of them come together under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's telling you that there's going to be a huge upheaval in the way men are governed on this earth. And that upheaval is forming right now before your very eyes. You'd be surprised at how many people in this country right here in America, your homeland, are so sick and tired of the status quo. They are fed up to hear with what the government has been doing to them and the rights have been taken away from them. There is an underlying current of rebellion that's going on right now in America. Do you know why? Because these governments are satanically inspired and satanically controlled. The Bible said he worketh in the spirit and the children of disobedience. All over this world, it has given itself over to the power of Satan. And so if we judge, what are we going to do? Preach the gospel and convert the world? I heard a preacher yesterday. I respect him. He was a good man, a man of God. He's gone now. But I heard him get up in the pulpit and I heard it straight from him and I thought, man, where did you come from? He said, now by the preaching of the gospel, we're reigning with Christ. And he said, you need to take that position where you're reigning with Christ. I said, son, we're not reigning over anything. This world is going to hell in a basket. It's going straight to the pit. The church of God is not reigning over anything. But the time will come when we will reign. And a king will reign in righteousness. And when he reigns in righteousness, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. 
Yes, sir, that day's coming, and it's coming soon. There is a huge upheaval taking place on planet Earth. Then there is the revelation of the Antichrist, Revelation chapter number 13. What's that, preacher? That is Satan incarnate in flesh. There's the revelation of war, Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 7. War in heaven. Can you believe that? War in heaven. Then in Revelation 19, verse 11, this is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Oh, how I love this scripture. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and in tr and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's the revelation, folks, of the king. He had on a crown, and he had on many crowns. He had the crowns of glory. He had the crowns of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He deserved the crowns because worthy is the king. Heaven opened. It opened up and it took Elijah. It opened up and it took Enoch. The heaven opens the day that God saved my soul and sent the Holy Ghost down in my heart. Heaven's going to open again. Say, preacher, I just don't believe it. You will. The revelation of judgment. Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11. This is a judgment that I don't want any part of. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. There is holiness. There his holiness begins to be made known to the creature. The holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. Separate, separate, separate unto his own element, to his own existence, to his own being. Separate from his creation. Notice. The heaven and the earth fled away, but he's still there. And there's a great white throne judgment. If you're unsaved today, that's where you're headed. To the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. The judgment seat of Christ is not a place of shouting and glory in God. There's going to be some weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at the judgment seat of Christ. But it won't be for your salvation. It'll be for the way you treated each other. It'll be for the works that follow you. It'll be for your service and your faithfulness to the Lord God. He's a good God. If you give a drink of water in His name, He said, I'll reward you for it. Hallelujah. The revelation of the New Jerusalem, chapter number 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Oh, what a beautiful city this is. I've seen the earth in Jerusalem and it took my breath away. I'm not exaggerating. When I crossed that hill, they saved it for the last thing. Brother Bevington would always do that. Bob Bevington, great man of God, going to be the Lord now. I respect him, love him dearly. He would always save Jerusalem for the last part of the tour. We've been everywhere else. We've been to Galilee. We've been all over the place. And then the bus comes across the hill. And here I am back here, man. I'm here to tell I want to get a view. I want to see this. When we topped that hill and looked at Moriah, and there the walls, and there the city, man, it took my breath away. I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Here we are. This is the city of the great king. This is where David uh, breached the walls and took it from the Jebusites. This is the city where our Lord was crucified. Here's Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. And there's Calvary. And there's Gethsemane. And there's the, the Kidron Valley. And there, my friend, Jerusalem. So, hallowed to God. What a place. And I walked around in the days for the next few days. And I'll tell you right now, that's the earth of Jerusalem. But the Bible says there's a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles that way, and 1,500 miles, perfect cube. Can you imagine how many people you can get in that perfect cube? Do you realize that every human being that has ever walked the face of this earth could fit neatly within that cube? Therefore, all the redeemed, every last one of the saved, every one of us whose name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life who are going to that new Jerusalem, there's a place in there for you. By the way, it's got walls of, of jet gates of pearl and walls of jasper and streets of pure transparent gold. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Thomas says, and he said, whether I go, you know the way you know, Thomas said, you know, Lord, we know not whether I go, how can we know the way? That's old Thomas being Thomas. 
Nothing wrong with Thomas. He kind of answers a lot of questions we all have. The Lord said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No man. Now get a hold of that. Get a hold of that good. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then when he showed up after the resurrection, Thomas said, I don't believe he's alive until I thrust my finger into his side and into his hand. Thomas said, I don't believe you. Then the Lord walked right through the wall and appeared. And he looked over at Thomas and said, come here, Tom. <laughs> come over here, Tom. Here, reach hither thy finger. Your finger put it in this hand. And he held that hand up and Thomas looked at that hand. He could see the light through the other end. He could see the light all the way through where the big hole would have been nailed to the cross. In the big place in the side was a spear from the Roman soldier. And Thomas said, my Lord, he never touched him. You don't read a thing in the Bible where Thomas ever touched him. He fell on his face and said, my Lord, and my God. And you like to think the Lord walked up and he put his hand on the head of Thomas and said, Thomas, you believe me. You believe me because you've seen me. He said, oh, Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are they that believe that have not seen you. That's you and me. <laughs> that's you and that's me. Do you believe? <laughs> yes, I believe. You better believe I do. Oh, yeah, I believe. I believe he's If I didn't believe he was alive, I'd close my book up and go get drunk. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die, and nothing to live for. Yeah, he's alive. He lives, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's way. He lives, he said. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. In Revelation 1, he said, I am the living one. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, he said, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. His life gives him authority. Not only is he worthy, but because he lives, he has authority. To open and shut. I open, no man shuts. I shut, no man opens. And all judgment is given to me. Bless his holy name. Folks, it's about the Lord Jesus. This is all about the Son of God. Hallelujah. And then the last revelation is in chapter number 22 in verse 1. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's a pure river of the water of life. All you gotta do is reach down and take a good drink of that, man. You haven't had a drink like you've had in your life. Like that drink. And the flowers and the trees are blooming and jumping up and down and shouting on both banks. Of life everywhere. Life in the light. Life in the trees. Life in the water. Because he's the Prince of Life. There he is. What makes this so wonderful here in Revelation 22? This is eternity. This is the revelation of eternity. Notice what it says over here in verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's eternity. That's one of the things that blows my mind always has, always will. Is that this little short span of a few years on this earth, here today and gone tomorrow. Those of you that are 20 years old right now, you'll find it hard to believe this, but you'll wake up one day and you'll be 50. You'll turn around a time or two and you'll be 70. And the first thing you know, you're going to look back upon your life and you're going to say, what the hell happened to it? Where did it all go? How do you, I'm telling you the truth. How many of you folks in here been here a while know what I'm saying? It's just gone. Just think about this. You're going to a land where time doesn't count. Forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah to God. Think about that. Where he called me from and where he's taken me. That's what the book of Revelation is about. Say, preacher, do you believe the book of Revelation is inspired? Yes, sir. Preacher, do you understand everything about Revelation? No, sir. No, sir. Read. Tell you in a heartbeat. Many things about the Bible I don't understand, but I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Word of God. All right, hallelujah to God. How I many know you're saved today and you know where you're going? Glory to God. Wouldn't it be the most wonderful thing that could happen to any of us, folks, any of us, is to hear that shout today? 
caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, thank you for the word of God, and for the faithfulness of the people and the attentiveness this morning. They listened, Father, and the Holy Ghost for being in their Heavenly Father and witnessing and confirming and affirming His Word to the hearts of the people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. One more time, you let this old boy stand up and speak for you. There's nothing I could ever do with this life, Lord, that's greater than that. You let me stand and speak for you. In the holy name I pray, for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. The book of Revelation opens for up the progressive damnation of Satan himself, who started as the angel of light in heaven, Lucifer the light bearer, and will eventually wind up in the lake of fire and brimstone. From the highest to the lowest, from the highest to the depths, having give, been given all privilege, glory, and beauty, and power, and to wind up in a lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone. And the man Christ Jesus that was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the lowly Galilean who walked this earth sinlessly, has now been lifted up to the very throne of God himself. As Christ goes up, Satan comes down. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. At this very present time, Satan is not bound in heaven. He is no, he is no more bound in hell, my friend, than the demons are. He walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. If you please, the book of Revelation is Satan's finest hour. For God gives him free run on this earth for seven long years. For seven years, Satan is able to walk to and fro as he never has before. It's his hour. It's the power of darkness, the power of hell. When the very hell itself is opened up and the inhabitants of hell are belched out upon this earth. Revelation chapter number 9. It's a time when there seems to be nothing holding Satan back. For he elevates his own man to the highest place on this earth. He becomes the very personification, the very incarnation of the devil himself. And we call him the Antichrist, the false Christ, the pseudo Christos. And he will come with his power. And his power will be not his own power, but it will be the power of the devil himself. And so Satan, my friend, is turned loose. And turned loose in the sense that he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Four horsemen show up in Revelation chapter number six. One of them is white, one is red, one is black, and one is pale. The white horse has a rider that has a bow and no arrows. He is an imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Antichrist as he comes riding forth upon this earth. When he eventually does make his appearance on planet earth, they'll be fully ready for him. For they've already received his spirit. They've already received his word. They've already received his Bible. They've already received his religion. They've already received his politics. They've already received his economic system. The world is ripe and ready for the coming of the rider of the white horse. Nothing has to happen tonight in order for tomorrow morning the man of sin to step forth and take control of this earth. Nothing has to change on planet earth for him in 24 hours to become the very incarnation of Satan himself. The Antichrist is on his way. If you have any sense tonight, you'd take note of that. You'd say to yourself, I understand now why things are as bad as they are. It begins to make sense why this earth is spinning out of control. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 6, the first one to show up is the man of sin. He's an imitation of Jesus Christ. He's an anointed one. He's a Christ himself. He preaches a false Jesus. He preaches a false spirit. He preaches from a false Bible into a false church. He's an imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He does his dirtiest work inside the church, in the halls of religion, in the Bible colleges throughout the world. He's a liar and a deceiver, always has been, always will be. He's the father of a lie. He invented it. It was born in his bosom and came forth from him in the very beginning. So the Bible tells you, get ready. The first writer to come upon planet Earth will be the Antichrist. They make fun of him. They mock him. They, think, they sing about him. They think they can control him by saying these things. But he's a powerful being. His power is not his own, but it's the power of Satan himself. Satan has all kinds of power that man does not have. He said to the Lord Jesus Christ, I have the kingdoms of this world and I can give them to you in a moment of time. Simply fall down 
and worship me. Christ said it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You can't buy the Son of God. He's not for sale. And so my friend, one will rise up for that power. He lives and breathes right now. He walks this earth. There are many candidates for the Antichrist, but there is one that Satan has put his finger upon, and he's alive at this very moment. The second rider's on a red horse. The red horse says that peace is taken from the earth. That means that war begins to reign upon planet earth. If you have half sense tonight, you know that we could be within a shooting war with Russia in no time. You know that we could be at war with Iran in no time. You know that a conflagration could break out in the Middle East and also in Eastern Europe. My friend, that could make the Second World War look like a picnic because of the weapons that we possess now. Far above and beyond anything they had in World War II. We have power of destruction that they could only dream about then. We have it in our disposal right now. This next war is going to wipe man from the earth. The next war will produce tens of millions of casualties. The next war will bring in the worst famine the earth has ever known. For the next rider is riding a black horse. And the Bible talks about on that rider the black horse how that food is so scarce. That food cannot be found. You may say tonight you believe this and believe that. But I'll tell you this when your stomach starts grumbling. And you become hungry. And you go and that talk look takes hold of your face. And you realize that your body is swill literally wasting away. You'll find something to eat. And it'll be at that moment that you reach the moment of truth in your own life. Will you sell your soul so that you can buy or sell and take the mark of the beast? Famine is a powerful enemy and it's a powerful weapon. You can put people in subjection with famine. If you take their food away, you can control them. We live in a, in a country right now where very few people grow their own food. It's grown by huge conglomerations and so forth. And they control the food that goes on your table. You say, not me, oh yes you. The love of money is the root of all evil. It was pure greed that drove this, this financial crisis that we're in. It was absolute greed. It was the greed of buying and selling homes and not even inhabiting them and flipping them as they called and possess one for a week or two and turn around and sell it and make a 50, 75, or 100% profit. It was pure, unmitigated greed. And my friend, is there any reason for you to believe tonight that greed will not dominate what man does in the tribulation period? It'll be the survival of the fittest, the strongest. They'll be the ones who overrun the others. Is not the Bible say, does it not say, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for skin? The Bible says it. You know who said it? The devil said it. And it's 99% true, but not always. There are those that would lay their life down for Jesus Christ. There are those that would rather die than deny his name. There are those that would die before they took the mark of the beast. There are those who would give their life for the Son of Man. And the devil never has figured them out and he never will figure them out. Amen. Because Satan operates totally on the superficial, the outside, the put on, the facade, the farce. That's what Satan lives by. He lives by the senses of the flesh. Being dead in the spirit, he has no contact with the Holy Ghost. Has no understanding of the real mind and soul of God. But once you're born again by the grace of God, you understand a higher law, a higher principle, a higher purpose. And that is that I, the life which I live in the flesh, I live not by the, not by the flesh, but I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My friend, horrible times are coming. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Most folks in America are accustomed to feel good. Rock rap, self-love, self-esteem sermons. I realize they're so accustomed today to having them packaged and repackaged and reprogrammed Sunday after Sunday that if they walk out and don't feel good about themselves, they blame the preacher. But sometimes it's awful good for you to not feel good about yourself. Sometimes it's good for you to take a good long look at who you are, what makes you tick, and let the Holy Ghost begin to deal with your heart. They're scratching and clawing right now for a dollar bill. They are the children of this world, and the only thing they care about is this life here and now. And that's where Satan will have his power. For he will control men like they've never been controlled before. But it doesn't end with a black horse. It doesn't end with a red horse. It doesn't end with a white horse. That's just the beginning. 
For the Bible says a pale horse comes riding out upon the scene. Let those, let those hooves hit planet earth. And when that fourth rider comes, Revelation chapter number 9 says, I saw the angel with the key to the bottomless pit. And when he comes down and opens that pit, creatures come up out of that pit that defy explanation. I'm talking about spirit beings that come out upon the earth and the scripture says sting men. And during that time their tails sting them. They plead for death and death will flee from them. You've never known a time like that. But the world is conditioned for it. They've been brainwashed to accept it. Every Hollywood movie that comes out anymore has got some kind of a spiritual twist to it. Some kind of a spiritual thing involved in it. There is an absolute fascination in this country now with the supernatural, with the spiritual. You talk to the average quote-unquote Christian and he, my friend, is like a band walking through a cafeteria line. He picks a little bit of Buddhism. He gets a little Confucianism. He gets a little Mohammed. He gets a little Taoism. He might borrow some from Christianity. He pulls a little witchcraft, a little pagan here, this and that, because he's spiritual. It's not about his relationship with Christ. It's about how great he is, how spiritual he is. So they revel in their spirituality. They, they wallow in their spirituality. They brag about their spirituality. And at no time are they true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's filling the church up, friend. That's relativism. That's the product of it. That's when it gives birth. And there are people who come to church and walk in here and I've watched their faces. I have a position you don't have. And I've read faces for a long time. And after 32 years, you just kind of get it imprinted in your soul. I know shock when I see it. And I've seen people come in here, friend, and it's like they say, they say to themselves, Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? I thought this was a church. It is a church. This is an anachronistic church. We're out of time. We fit back a hundred years ago. We're not part of the modern scene. Sorry. No big screens up here. Sorry. Hate to let you down. Sorry, no positive feel-good messages. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry about all that. We don't have a band in here to play for you. We're not going to rock you. We're not going to rap you. We're going to sing the songs of Zion. Amen. We're going to sing the old stuff, the good stuff, the stuff you heard for I preached tonight. That's the good stuff. That's what we're going to sing. Why? Because the Holy Ghost witnesses it. When we see it for some reason, the Holy Ghost shows up. How long do you think he'd hang around here if we started rocking and rapping? Just tell me. So my friend, there's a vast difference between the true church of God and this put on farce that calls itself Christianity today. But the sad thing is this town's full of people who really believe they're Christians and will look you in the eye and as sincerely as they can say, they'll say, well, a Buddhist is going to heaven. A Mohammedan's going to heaven. As long as he's sincere about his faith, you're talking to relativism and they don't know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell's coming, folks. Four horsemen in Revelation chapter number six. This earth isn't ready and it's going to be a horrible place to be. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you saved? Are you ready for that? Are you prepared for that day? For the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter number four, the apostle John's on the Isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I've read it time and time and time again. Every time I read it, it thrills my soul. John said, I heard a voice in heaven saying, come up hither. And John gets caught up hither. He gets caught up out of this earth and looks at everything that happens on it. And the church doesn't show up again till Revelation 19 when heaven, heaven opens a second time. And this time they come out of heaven and come back to the earth. John said, even so come Lord Jesus come. Amen. I have no hope in planet Earth. I have no hope in the government. I have no hope in the Republicans or the Democrats. Sorry, I don't want to make you mad tonight. Politics will not save America. I have no hope in the government's ability to solve our problems. I have no hope in the so-called church that's supposed to be preaching the gospel. I have no hope in science falsely so-called. For every time they turn around, they try to destroy the validity and authority and authenticity of the Word of God. Like the young man said a moment ago, the apostasy in his school, for they don't want the Christians to argue. They want to take a neutral position about evolution. They don't. Week in and week out, the teacher gets up 
and rams it down the throat of the young people like it's a science, like it's a fact, like it's a proven fact. I have no hope in higher education. I'll tell you this right now. One man said years ago, education without salvation is damnation. The more you think about it, the more truth there is in that statement. That's a profound statement. If you don't know the, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can go through Harvard and still serve the Lord. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll wash your brain when they get a hold of you. For they'll load you up with they'll load you up with philosophy, they'll load you up with biology, they'll load you up with comparative religion, they'll load you up with all the garbage that comes out of the college science, uh, out of the college textbook. And by the time you've ingested all that junk, you won't believe in anything. They'll destroy your faith in the Lord God Almighty. Amen. I have no I have no faith in higher education. I have no faith in me. Time and time again, I've stood up in this pulpit to preach the Word of God and wondered where the message was going to come from and where the power and the Spirit would be. And the moment I opened my mouth, something came down from above and began to move in my soul. It was God showed me in an indisputable way. I'm with you, son. You do what I've called you to do, and I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. I'm not giving to you a tonight an excuse for not studying. I study the book. But what I'm giving you to you tonight is the God's way of letting his man know he's faithful, and he's going to be with him through hell or high water. God's faithful. What's, that's what allows me to pastor. That's what allows me to minister. That's what will get you through. It won't be your faithfulness. It'll be His faithfulness. In ways that you can't deny, God's hand is in your life. He loves to manifest Himself like that. And He'll do it every time. Amen. So I don't have any faith in me. I don't have any faith in you. I don't really have any faith. I'm sorry. Don't make you mad. But there's nobody in this house tonight that I've got the fourth person of the Trinity. None of you I have exalted to some high spiritual plane. Do you know why? I've lived 62 years. I know man. I know what's in man. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one of him when he was here 2,000 years ago, they said of him, neither did he confide in man or trust man, for he knew what was in man. So I'm sorry. Still, friends, I got no faith in you, but I got faith in your God. I got faith in the one you have faith in. I've got faith in the one you believe in. I've got faith in that spirit in your soul. I've got faith in his power to join us together in Christian communion and love and fellowship. I've got faith in that. I've got faith in the God that saved you. But you, you're just a vessel in his hands. You could be standing today, fallen tomorrow. Amen. So my faith doesn't stand on man. My faith stands on the one who saved my soul. I don't have any faith in the Baptist. Sorry. Got no faith in the Methodist. Got no faith in the Episcopalian, Presbyterian. Got no faith in the Catholic Church. I know they're the one true apostolic church and the Pope's Peter. I know that. I realize he's the vicar of Christ. He speaks ex cathedra, blah, blah, blah. I have no faith in him either. He just like me. He better get saved or he won't make it through the gates of glory. Amen. In fact, it might be harder for him than it was for me. Because after they bragged on him, lifted him up, exalted him, praised him, kissed his toe, carried on like he's the greatest thing on earth. One of these days he's going to find out he'll die just like all the rest of us. And he better have the grace of God covering his sins. Amen. He better have or he won't make it through the gates of glory. I got no faith in him, no faith in his church, no faith in this church, no faith in your church. I got no faith in the news media. I'm sorry. CBS, NBC, ABC, even Fox and CNN. Even drugs and rents and all the rest of them, I still have no faith in them. Why? Because they're fallible men. They're fallible men. Every last one of them have their own agenda. There's just one I have faith in. I believe in his word. I believe in his eyes. I believe in his hair. I believe in his feet. I believe in that girdle that he's girded with. I believe in what comes forth from his mouth. I believe in his work. I believe in what he came for. I believe in his motives. I believe in everything about him. I believe it was all pure. It was all holy. It was all perfect. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ could not do a wrong. I believe everything he ever did, ever has done, ever will do will be perfect. 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 I got faith in him. I got faith in him. I believe in him. I trust him. I love him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that inspires me tonight. When I read the book of Revelation, I say to myself, this is for them. This is for the unbeliever. This is for all those that don't know him. 
All these manifestations of his glory and his power and his might in the book of Revelation for that crowd. Say, why preacher? Because I already know that. <laughs> How do ever been of it? He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the only one that is qualified to open the book and the seals and unloose the judgment of God. He's coming judge of the mankind and of this earth. Well, I believe all of these things before I ever see him in glory. Peter, I know exactly what you're talking about. You say you believe because you've seen talking to the first century believer in Christ. He said, but there are those who haven't seen and blessed are they that believe and haven't seen. That's me, that's you, that's us. He made provision for us. He knew we'd be here 2,000 years later. That's just a couple of the ticks on the clock for God. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day with the Lord. I mean, after he made man and winds it all up, it's just a week. Imagine one that liveth from everlasting to everlasting, from eternity to eternity, and liveth and bideth in, in his own element. There is none beside him. He said, I'm going to take one week out of eternity past into eternity future. One week, just seven short days, and the whole history of mankind will be consummated and brought to fruition in one short week. Can you imagine just one week? You mean, preacher, that's all of our 7,000 year history? You mean that's all the time we take up with God? Just a week, just a week, just a week. Cherubims have been around at least four, five, six, seven, ten weeks, a month or two, and maybe even a year in God's calendar. I don't know how long a seraphim been. I don't know when he made them. I mean, they've been around a whole lot longer than man. Angels, well, they predate you by a whole lot. The Bible said in the book of Job, they shouted when God created the earth, brought it into existence. Do you know what they shouted from? They shouted from being astounded, scared to death. For at one moment, here's God and here's them and nothing but black eternity. And the next moment, bang! Right before their very eyes is everything, all of the creation. My, I'm sure those angels said to themselves, we knew he was Almighty God, and now we know he's Almighty God, and he's even more Almighty God than we can even take in. He's God, and he's God alone. You know something, friend? I don't care how high you ever go. I don't care how near the throne you ever get. I don't care how great you'll ever be when God blesses you and gives you crowns and you can lay them at his feet. There's a chasm you'll never cross. There's a line of demarcation you can't cross over. There's a vastness that separates us. That is that my friend is you. There's no way you can even come comprehend it tonight. What is that? The vast difference between the creator and his creatures, his creation. It's still there. It's still there. And I can't cross it from here to there, but he crossed it from there to here. For when the Son of God came down to the earth and manifested himself from time into et from eternity into time, he crossed that chasm. He crossed that great divide. And he's the only one who could do it. He crossed over from that place of Godhood into manhood. I couldn't go from here to there, but he came from there to here. But you know what he's going to do, don't you? He's going to take us from here back to there. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, he did. You say, save me, preacher, that's the first step. I'm born again, hallelujah. If, you can't be, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. But that's just the beginning. That's just the start. That's what qualifies you for heaven. He started something and he's going to finish. He's going to take me back across that great divine. Hit me! Hit me! Stop.